Okay, welcome back to the channel, folks. This, uh, today we're gonna to talk about the uh, Remington Model 1148 and a few of its variants. It's actually a, a viewer request for this model, and we were able to get a hold of one. We didn't have it in stock, but uh, the lady that does our social media and training coordination knew somebody, so it helps to know people that know people. And we were able to get a hold of uh, a variant of the 1148 anyway to do this little video. So if you guys have requests for models that you want us to go over or talk about, please drop them in the comments. We'll try it. Uh, we'll try to get a hold of one if we don't have one. Uh, as long as it's not super rare, we probably can. So the Remington 1148 um, is a pretty significant model in Remington history. It's a post-war gun and uh, Remington had the Model 11, the, auto, the Remington auto-loading shotgun in line, and uh, after the war, they wanted to reduce the manufacturing cost of the gun and make a more streamlined semi-automatic shotgun. Uh, that said, there were still no gas-operated shotguns existent during that time period. This was all long recoil, uh, like the Remington 11, like the Browning A5. So what we mean by that is when this gun is fired, the barrel actually recoils with the bolt into the chamber and then it's propelled back forward by, the, uh, by a large spring underneath here on the magazine tube. Then there's a, an existing spring in an action tube in the buttstock that pushes the bolt back forward once the action cycles. So uh, there's no gas system, there's no piston, there's, there's no uh, interchange of gas, there's no ports in the barrel. It's all a, a long recoil system. So there's springs and friction pieces, and we'll have this fore end off in a minute to show you something else about this particular variant. And maybe it'll make a little bit more sense if you, if you haven't already figured it out. But uh, the significant thing about this is, this is uh, the first model, the Remington 1148, of the kind of the new generation of shotguns uh, that Remington was gonna start putting out after World War II a more streamlined look. And we, we've talked in previous episodes of Remington stuff about some of the designers in that pre-war era. And this shotgun was designed by the post-war design team led by uh, Ray Crittenden, uh, who is one of the, the most prolific Remington designers of the post-war era. So uh, he and um, Ellis Hallstrom and C.R. Johnson was a design team that did this. And they actually had help from one of the uh, chief industrial designers from the RCA Corporation designing the overall look of the, of the shotgun itself. He'd done some work for Remington Cutlery and a few other things with Remington, but uh, he was designing things like console televisions and, and stuff like that for RCA. But he developed the overall, or assisted in developing the overall aesthetic, if you will, of the gun. And that was carried over to almost every other Remington model, including the 870, the 740, the 742, on into the 1100. I mean, it, it just kept going. And a lot of other manufacturers kind of, not, I don't want to say copied the design, but had similar designs as well. So the, uh, this gun, was, uh, the design was finalized in 1948. It, it became generally available for sale in 1949. This particular shotgun, this little 20 gauge shotgun here, uh, is April of 1949. <clears throat> so it's a first year gun. And we'll show you some interesting things about that here in just a second. So around 455,000 uh, and change, 455, 600 is the number on Remington's website, was made of this model. The vast majority of those were 12 gauge, followed by 16 gauge. Um, in that time frame, 16 gauge was extremely popular gauge, almost as popular as 12. Went away for a while, now it's making a resurgence. And you see a lot more new 16 gauges now than you had even 10 years ago. Uh, and then the 20 gauge was third most popular, followed by the 410. This gun was chambered in 410, and uh, the, the least uh, produced was the 28 gauge guns. So the 28 gauge gun and the 410 uh, caliber, it's not really a gauge, the 410 uh, in the 1148 uh, actually have a bit more collector value to them, particularly in the, in the higher grades. The gun was available in five grades. Uh, well, it depends on whether you consider it a grade or not. But uh, This is a, an A grade or the standards would be an 1148A. Uh, then they had the, the, uh, the B grade, which is also 
called the uh, special grade, then the D grade, which was tournament, and the F grade, which was premier. And the difference there is engraving on the receiver, the F grade even had uh, inlaid gold uh, animals and things, much high grade wood, much high grade checkering and carving on the stock. So, um, of course, the cost went up on all that. They were also offered in a ride gun configuration, 12 gauge with a 20 inch cylinder bore barrel. This is a, a 28 modified one, it's 20 gauge here. And then they made a rifled slug gun, the rifle slug special, which was a, a again, a, a 20 inch barrel with uh, rifle sights, the same sights used in all the 721 rifle. Barrel itself was smooth bore, however. This gun itself um, is a variant called the Sportsman 48. Uh, it's produced during the same time frame as the 1148, which was 1949, all the way up to 1969 when the gun was eventually replaced by the Model 1100, which had come out in 1963. So the Sportsman's 48 differed from the 1148 uh, in the fact that the magazine tube is semi-permanently modified to accept only two shells. Now back in around 1935 is when the first federal regulations came out about the amount of shells you could have in your shotgun for migratory birds, uh, waterfowl specifically. But uh, most shotguns, and still to this day, come with a removable plug that sits inside the magazine tube that limits the ability to put more than uh, two additional shells in the magazine tube to give you the total of three. This gun, and we'll, we'll pull this forehand off real quick, I saved a wheel. There we go. Bear in mind this is under tension from this recoil spring. So this gun here, and you can see it right here, is dimpled on the magazine tube. So that physically prevents the magazine follower from coming forward, so it limits the capacity uh, to two shells. Now, having said that, and, and I've done it on, on quite a few Sportsman versions of, of different guns before, Sportsman, not really a model for Remington so much as a line. Uh, the Remington 11, the older gun, was also uh, available as a Sportsman with the same thing, the same block mag tube. So normally, uh, this can be removed. I've always used a, uh, a mandrel uh, to, to push through and, and raise that raise this little dent and there's one over here as well to raise those little uh, indentations up to allow and then it's just a, a regular 1148 mag tube. Replacing the magazine tube on these guns is not, uh, is not they're brazed in so it's not something that's normally done outside of a factory setting but um, they, they can be removed. I've seen them drilled out, I've seen other things so the sportsman version of the uh, 1148 or the Model 11 that's what we're talking about when we talk about the sportsman stuff. And it was available as a sportsman in those other grades that we talked about as well. The gun was reintroduced in 1970 uh, under the Mohawk name. And uh, Mohawk also is a line of Remington products. Uh, they applied it to other guns. Uh, the Model 600, uh, it was a Mohawk a rifle. And this became the Mohawk 48. And the Mohawk line of guns were really targeted toward, toward the larger, uh, what would be known today as big box uh, distributors. They typically had, uh, instead of walnut stocks, they were birch finished, I mean walnut finished uh, birch stocks, hardwood stock. And they didn't have quite as few, quite as many features. Uh, for example, those were all plain barrel guns like this one. The 1148 could be had solid rib or vent rib guns, particularly in, in skeet grade uh, type stuff. So how do you evaluate, if you have the opportunity to buy an 1148, how would you evaluate one and what would you look for? What are the, the problem points with it? Much the same as with the Auto 5. The gun, as we showed you, recoils into the action, so it recoils along this, this magazine tube, so people over all the magazine tubes and this is a friction ring actually here's, here's. this is a friction ring that lives here 
or lives down here, wherever you're going to, whichever way you have the gun configured. But uh, in order for a friction ring to work, it needs friction. So when people over oil it, it causes that barrel to really recoil uh, rapidly. And we end up seeing a crack here on the magazine tube. That also occurs when people don't have the gun or the, the magazine tightened down enough or too tight. There's kind of a sweet spot. Uh, finger tight, a little more than finger tight is where you want that to be. So a lot of people either don't or allow it to become loose and the gun cracks, they over tighten it and the gun cracks. So this one's not, so that's, that's good. Uh, this is the aluminum uh, trigger plate. We see that carried over into the 870. We see the trigger pins carried over into the 870. This stamped, uh, instead of forged and machine, the stamped internal pieces, we see that through the 870 and, and all the, the Remington shotgun models ever since. So that's another uh, post-war innovation that Remington uh, kind of instituted in order to try to reduce manufacturing cost. So this particular gun, again, April of 49, it's had a few things done to it. Uh, we can tell that there's been finish added to the wood, uh, probably some type of true wall or something. The, the checkering is flattened and filled in here with, uh, with the oil. This piece normally, or a lot of times, you find it either missing or broken, this pistol grip cap. This pad uh, is probably a 60s add-on. It's a belt nap bluegrass pad from belt nap hardware. So uh, the gun was cut at some point and, and this was attached and it's, it's become very hard. So it's not really a great recoil pad anymore and it's not really uh, done well, very, very, very well here. But this gun is really not a super collectible, but it is a great shooting little gun and there's no reason why it wouldn't work in the dove field. So we talked about it being a first year gun. Remington had serialization and they did serialize the barrels to the receiver up until about 1952. So although there's really not a chart anywhere where you can see when the gun was made by the serial number, there is here with this barrel code. Uh, this is a decodable barrel code here. Remington used a letter code for a month and year of manufacture. And you can go to the Remington Society of America uh, web page uh, and, and they have that chart there that you could look up. So this, uh, this particular one decodes to April of 49, which is consistent with how the gun is serialized and how the gun is marked. So uh, obviously on guns that are designed to have interchangeable barrels, that can be a little bit problematic. Is this the correct date code? Is it not the correct date code? Uh, if the barrel's been interchanged. But since these, since this matches this, then uh, we're obviously, we, we believe that April of 49 is correct for this whole gun. So the next question is, what can I shoot through it? Well, it's chambered for two and three quarter inch 20 gauge shells or shorter. Uh, so uh, they had two and a half inch 20 gauge shells at one point. So uh, that's why that says that. But with modified, with a modified choke, I would be comfortable shooting only moderately sized steel shot through it. Uh, other non-lead shot like bismuth or heavy shot, you could probably get away with whatever 20 gauge rounds you could find through it. But uh, I, would, I would stay away from shooting the larger diameter steel shot and simply because you don't need to. Uh, this, this old gun has seen, seen its share of, uh, seen its share of shotgun shells. Well, that's a, a tongue twister. But uh, so anyway, 1148, the first of the modern era uh, Remington shotguns. They would go on to produce a gas operated shotgun, the Model 58, starting in, uh, in the mid or the late 50s. Didn't go over too well, it was heavier, it wasn't nearly as reliable as this gun. It became the Model 878, and that went along to about 1963. And then the Model 1100 gas operated gun came along. And of course that was hugely popular. They kept this gun in line until 1969, so for about six years they were produced alongside the 1100. And the 1100 just absolutely killed it in terms of sales, so the 1148 was discontinued until they did a cleanup of parts in, in the early 70s with the Mohawk. So uh, that's the story of the 1148 gun. They're around, they're available. They made 455,000 and change of these things. Uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. Just keep the magazine tube clean 
very, very lightly oiled. Um, and the gun should last forever. So uh, please like uh, and subscribe to the channel if you would and let us know if there's anything that you want to take a look at and uh, we'll keep bringing you content for as long as you guys will watch and uh, again appreciate it thanks and see you next time